Hi, I'm Dr. Muscle, and welcome to Lecture 3, uh, Moral Conventionalism, where we take a look at this moral theory through the lens of Thomas Hobbes, uh, uh, English moral philosopher, actually just an English philosopher in general, he had a lot to say, um, of the 17th century, born 1588, died in 1679. Um, so he and another thinker we're going to talk about, actually right after in the next lecture, John Locke, um, as we'll see, and we'll talk about these two together quite a bit, especially in the next lecture, we'll be juxtaposing the two quite a bit. Um, they have a lot in common. In fact, Locke is going to say, he's going to come on the scene shortly after Hobbes. His dates are, I have them here, 1632 to 1704. So he's shortly, maybe 30, 40 years after Hobbes, also an uh, English philosopher. Probably much you know, more known, uh, widely known, especially here in the United States. Um, but they have a lot of similar things to say, and we're going to see how that's the case, especially regarding uh, morality. But they will have some key differences, some significant ones. Uh, um, so although they say many of the same things, where they differ, they are you know, pretty significant. And actually, it's interesting, and we'll see why this is the case, but there's a reason why so many more Americans tend to be familiar with John Locke as opposed to Thomas Hobbes, even though they deliver uh, very, very similar philosophies, uh, both political and moral. Um, so more on that. Stay tuned. You know, why is it that so many of us are familiar with uh, John Locke and not Thomas Hobbes when they say very, very similar things throughout most of their philosophy? Stay tuned for the answer to that. Uh, but they're both... Uh, you know, British, uh, English philosophers. Um, we'll talk about Thomas Hobbes first. And so they both speak about this so-called state of nature, this, uh, you know, what is the state of nature? We'll get into that here shortly. Um, but they have some interesting things to say, especially Hobbes. Uh, and Hobbes, I think the first thing that's noteworthy to point out about him is that his biography shines through in his philosophy maybe more than uh, any other thinker we'll, we'll talk about. Um, now, obviously, one's life is going to influence one's philosophy, but with Hobbes, you really see that being the case. Um, for example, you know, he, he pretty much lived in a constant state of um, threat. Uh, throughout his life, uh, he was you know, uh, exposed to the threat of war. Um, pretty much, I think, uh, I'm not an expert on this time period at all, so don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure for his entire life, there was, you know, the threat of war. Um, and you see that shining through, again, in his philosophy. Uh, I think there was some, I think they quoted in the book, um, you know, famous quote, you know, my mother gave birth to twins, myself and fear. And so fear, that's this um, dominant theme, not only in his own life, which makes sense if you're constantly facing the threat of war, um, but then also in his philosophy. Um, and so I, I would... Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to emphasize this point quite a bit, but if you lack that sense of fear, that constant sense of fear, and I'm not trying to suggest that his is ill-founded. I mean, again, if we were all exposed to this threat of war, who knows what you know we'd be thinking, how, how differently we'd be thinking. But if you lack that gloomy outlook on the way the world works, then a lot of what Hobbes has to say philosophically in terms of his political philosophy and his moral philosophy, that's going to you know, not hold much weight for you because a lot of it is founded on that sort of underlying view of human nature, that we have this constant disposition uh, to, to be, you know, self-interested above all else and to not care about others, consider others. And if you are, you know, not of that same mindset, that is actually one of the ways that he and Locke differ. Locke is much more of an optimist. And so if you're more Lockean in that regard, then again, a lot of what Hobbes is going to have to say and what follows, and we'll note the ways as we go, um, you know, they're not going to be near as convincing. But on the other hand, if you do share his sort of fundamental view of human nature that, um, you know, that, we, that we're all after, me, myself, and I, that there's this constant, that we all pose a constant threat to one another, uh, if that does kind of make some sense, and he does make some good points, right? You know, do we not all lock our doors even in modern times with a sovereign in place, with the policing force, right? Even within our own doors, within our own houses, do we not lock our own chests? All right, if you find some of that convincing, then maybe you'll be more on board, on board with Hobbes. Um, but I want to point out, you know, so his biography, his life, uh, that you can really see that um, 
play its role then in his subsequent philosophy. Fear is playing a huge role in, in both. Um, uh, his, his most notable work would be the Leviathan, um, where he basically talks, there's a lot of his social and political philosophy comes out in this. And he talks about, you know, this notion of civilization and how is it that we came to came to be in sort of the society and civilization that we find ourselves in now, right, with governments in place and so on. How, how was it that this came to be as it is? And so that's what he's, he's interested in this, in, the, in this famous book called The Leviathan. And so he turns his attention to this so-called um, state of nature then, where he thinks is kind of the starting point. So he's interested in the, the emergence of societies, civilizations, governments. And so he says, look, to figure this out, Right, we're going to have to take a look at what he calls again the state of nature, and I alluded to that in the beginning. By the way, I I uh, realized in the logic lecture I completely uh, I alluded to turning pages and referencing that as I proceed, and then didn't do it once. Uh, but I am turning from two to three here, so we're turning our attention to state of nature here. You know what does Hobbes mean by this so-called state of nature? Well, in general, he just means to denote what we would call like a, a state of anarchy, basically. Right there, basically, it, it denotes the lack of all I mentioned earlier, right? A civilization, government, society. Right? So it's imagine, uh, you know, human beings running amok in the wilderness, right? With, with no structure, overarching structure in place, no policing force in place, right? Imagine a lot of us have seen this series Lost, right? Where they get, um, you know, they're abandoned on this island basically after their plane goes down, right? Um, you know, that subsequent situation, right, that, that kind of captures what he means uh, by the state of nature, or like uh, a lot of us are familiar with, and this is often brought up in discussions of Hobbes' moral theory, uh, Lord of the Flies, William Golding's Lord of the Flies. So if you had to read that in English class, I remember having to read that. I don't know what this says about me, but that was one of the few books I remember liking, and it's very, very dreary. It's oftentimes um, pointed out as an illustration of what Hobbes would say would turn how, how things would turn out if a bunch of boys if you're not familiar on the lord of the flies they're they're uh, abandoned on this island and they try to um you know hold some semblance of structure and society but that all sort of falls apart and pretty soon war uh war uh, emerges and that's exactly kind of what hobbes would predict would happen um, but i bring up lost and and lord of the flies because i think these are kind of good give us sort of good pictures of what Hobbes would mean by the state of nature, right? Imagine, again, there's no policing force in place. There's no government. Um, yet those two, even those two aren't, you know, perfect analogies because it, even in, in both of those cases, right, in Lost and in Lord of the Flies, the group that ends up on the island, they're still coming from some semblance of structure, right? They lived in a society. They had some semblance of order and so on. So it's not quite on par with what he meant by the state of nature. Kind of think of it as the beginning point, right? When, when we didn't have any semblance of structure, right? Um, no sense of government, um, no, no policing force to loom large over us and to monitor our, our, uh, our behavior and so on. Uh, but that could kind of give you a, a sense nonetheless of kind of what he envisioned by the state of nature. Okay, so there's no, there's no government in place. It's basically what we would mean by a state of anarchy. Okay, no sense of it's the gen, general society. Okay. Uh, now, what does this place look like? You know, is our, in other words, is this a pretty picture, right? Is this a place we want to go visit? Well, I think a lot of that depends, right, on your, again, your underlying view of human nature. Now, for Hobbes, no, it's not going to be a pretty picture, right? It's not going to be a place we want to visit, and we'll get into why that is, you know, why this constant sense of fear is present. And we'll get into that here in a moment. Um, but again, this points at one of the, the things, right, that we were alluding to earlier. It makes sense that he's going to be kind of um, a little worried about a situation where there's no policing force, right? If he's if he views us all as potential threats, right? But if you lack that view that all of us pose potential threats to one another, that we're constantly looking to hoard uh, goods and so on, if you lack that perspective, then the so-called state of nature, maybe it wouldn't be so conducive to a sense of fear. Maybe you wouldn't constantly be on edge just because there's no policing force you can call, right? If somebody try, you know, comes wandering by. Um, okay, so back to the, the lecture where we're turning to slide or page four. 
Okay, the next thing we, we want to know, okay, and we'll get into, again, why he associates a sense of fear with the state of nature here in a moment, but he talks about there being this essential state of equality in the state of nature. Um, and what he means by that is uh, he's not discounting, you know, that some of us might be smarter or stronger than others, right? Obviously, that, that could be the case, but it doesn't matter how smart or strong you are. We all have good reason to fear death, so says Hobbes, in the state of nature. Okay? All men and women are equal in the sense that they're constantly uh, on edge in fearing for their own lives, right? And constantly worried about their own survival. So it doesn't matter how strong you are, right? You could be the big bad bully. And what's to stop a bunch of other people, though, from ganging up on and taking you out, right? It doesn't matter how smart you are. It wants to stop the big bad bully in the state of nature from coming and blowing your house down and doing much more than that, right? Um, so, uh, look, you know, he acknowledges that there might be differences in the sense that, you know, some of us are smarter, stronger, et cetera, but we're all constantly on edge. We're constantly experiencing the sense of fear and we're constantly worried for our own survival. So it's in that sense, then that we're essentially equal, right? In the sense that we're all living this constant nightmare, if you will. Okay, so we're all equal in the sense that everyone fears death and for good reason, okay? Uh, turning to slide or page five, he says in this, and this is kind of the whole impetus of the whole um, the whole driving force behind why there's a sense of essential quality and, and why that's based on this essential fear in the state of nature. That all derives from the sense that we have a right to everything, Hobbes says, of the state of nature. Right? In this state of nature, we have a so-called right to everything. And that's really the ultimate issue on Hobbes' account. And again, if you don't share his underlying suspicion of everyone, right, and this sort of gloomier view of human nature, then our having a right to everything in the state of nature might not pose as big of an issue, right? It might not lead to a constant sense of fear. But for him, that's exactly what it's going to do, okay? Because you can't trust everyone. And what he means by having a right to everything is that in this state of nature, since there's no policing force, we all have the ability to do whatever we want. So for Hobbes, a right simply means the freedom or ability to do something. And in this state of nature, where there's no government, no, no our overarching policing force in place, we have the freedom or ability to do whatever we want. There's nothing off limits, so to speak. Okay, so it's in that sense, he's saying we have a right or ability to do whatever we want. We have a right to everything. And that's kind of a famous um, quote on his part. Um, and again, it just means that in this state of nature, we have absolute freedom. Now, hey, that sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. Right. Um, again, assuming Hobbes' position, here's the problem. It sounds pretty good for me, but the problem is all of you who I can't trust also having absolute freedom. That's the problem. You guys having a right to everything. If it was just me that had a right to everything, that'd be great, right? Me having freedom and absolute freedom, the ability to do whatever I want, but yet you guys couldn't. Well, then everything would be dandy, right? But the problem is everyone has this right to everything and you can't trust anyone else. And that's a recipe for disaster. Okay, so uh, I like to point out how, um, well, before I get to that, so he says, this is a fam very famous quote too, right? Uh, indicative of this idea that, hey, we have a right to everything in the state of nature. He says, in such a condition, in other words, in state of nature, this is a quote, in such a condition, every man has a right to everything, even to one another's body. That's from page 188, and that's end quote. Um, so again, that hits him suggesting what's you know, the case here of the state of nature. Going to uh, slide six, then, or page six. So the issue, and I like to start whenever I teach social political philosophy by um, alluding to this basic underlying tension that's at play. And I think it behooves us to discuss this here in conjunction with what Hobbes is saying then, right? We have this underlying tension at play here between freedom on the one hand and security. And the major issue here uh, for Hobbes is that we have way too much of this and not enough of this. And so I was mentioning with social and political philosophy, whenever I teach intro to social and political philosophy, I, I start off by suggesting that almost every discussion, debate, et cetera, that we have in social and political philosophy, or at least in political philosophy, you can say in some sense boils down to this, this underlying tension and trying to discern, you know, where at, where, where exactly is the, you know, perfect spot, okay? Where do we want to go, right? Um, now, the problem with the state of nature, according to Hobbes, is, you know, it's way over here, right? For him, it's, hey, it's a position of absolute freedom. 
Okay, so it's right here. The problem is on his account, the complete lack of security, right? So he's going to suggest our task then, right? If we want to not live in a state of constant fear, then is obviously to move this way. Of course, the question is going to be, and everybody that's not an anarchist would agree with that, right? We have to move some, some in some measure this way, right? We can't, this is basically a state of anarchy, right? We have to move this way to some degree, but how far? And so what I often would say, you know, in political debates and political discussions, that's exactly what the debate's about, right? How far to move this way? Or maybe if we've already moved too far this way nowadays, maybe how far to move back this way? You know, take, for example, the Patriot Act, which was enacted shortly after 9-11 or September 11th, right? Um, what was it presumably enacted for? To garner greater security, right? But why were a lot of people up in arms? Because it was an invasion of privacy or, you know, an infringement on our freedoms, okay? So, right, there you have it, right? That basic tension, again, at play. And there's another example. Uh, so for Hobbes, the issue, right, is in the state of nature and having all of this, we completely lack security. Okay, that's the problem. Having freedom is great, but having no security sucks. Okay, and it's uh, so sucky, in fact, that he says it's way we're way better off forfeiting right our so-called right to everything and moving this way, right? Getting out, basically, what that means is getting out of the state of nature. Okay, so that's what he's going to suggest we do, right? So the state of nature for him, terrible, you know, not a good place at all. Uh, and it's precisely because we completely lack security in the first place, right? There's no sense of security, uh, again, because we all have, not just me, right, but all of you guys, that's the problem, right? All those potential threats out there, they all have the freedom to do whatever they want. Okay? Um, he also alludes to, so let's go ahead and erase this for now. Bear with me here. He alludes to, and it's important to highlight these at least for a moment, Three natural sources of conflict. Now, these are always going to be present given our human nature, right? Um, but they're especially present and prevalent and problematic in the state of nature, okay? So one, we have what he says is competition. There's only so many goods, right? There's a, uh, the resource I always use in class is bananas and cans of Guinness. I don't know how, how I got started on that or at what point or why, but you know, there's only so many bananas and there's only so many cans of Guinness and there's so many of us, right? And we have to, or bottles of water, or whatever your preference is in terms of drinks and, and food. But you know, you get the idea, right? There's only so many resources um, and there's competition for those resources. Okay? And so inevitably, right, we're going to, engage in conflict over those resources, especially given Hobbes' view of our underlying human nature. More on that in a moment, right? He says this is motivated by gain. Um, you know, even in present day, right, when we're out of the state of nature, you know, we, we have competition, for example, for a highly coveted job. There's only one position, you know, you know, hundreds of highly qualified applicants. Okay, so again, that's an example, even removing ourselves from the state of nature, we still have these are always present, right? But they're especially palpable and problematic in the state of nature, he says. So competition, we have diffidence, which is basically a fancy word for fear. And this leads to, this is motivated by security. He says this leads to like preemptive aggression. So we notice, um, for example, we realize that everybody else uh, poses those threats. And so we try to take them out preemptively before they, they can then come steal our Guinness or our bananas, right? We take them out first. Um, and then he has a third source, this pride or what I think he says glory in our text here. So that's motivated by our, you know, reputation, our uh, attempt to, I think what he's getting at here is, right, if I take you out and you out and you out, if, if we build up this reputation, then people are less likely to mess with us, right? Uh, but all three of these, he says, are sources of conflict. They're going to uh, be reasons why we're at each other's throat, especially uh, in the state of nature, right? Um, and by the way, while I'm thinking of it, I should point out, so I mentioned Hobbes and Locke, and I mentioned how Locke is much more of an optimist. So let me get in, give it into an example that I like to, to, to bring up to, to sort of illustrate that. Um, so again, Hobbes and Locke on a whole, very, very similar, okay? But um, to appreciate some of their differences, one of them is in this underlying view of human nature. Locke is very much 
uh, much more an optimist, okay? So take this example. Imagine we're in the state of nature. Hobbes, Hobbes the pessimist, is gonna say, uh, so you see so-and-so, or somebody sees another person's bananas or resources, right, unguarded. He could go over and take those bananas or that resource uh, without consequence. Nobody's gonna know. Hobbes is gonna say, huh, look, there might be the rare exception, but 99 times out of 100, we're going to go get them, right? We're, we're selfish by nature, me, myself, and I. Locke, no, that's not the case. Locke's going to say something like, look, if you're dying of hunger, yeah, you're going to go take the bananas. But if your life isn't in danger, there's no imminent threat, right? Your survival's not at stake. Uh, you're not going to go out of your way to just take those goods, even though you know you can get away with it, right? We have a, uh, a more a natural desire to want to cooperate, Locke says, and you know, we sympathize with others and we want to flourish together, um, if at all possible. So uh, I think that's always been helpful for me to sort of capture the difference. That is, again, a significant difference between the two, right? And that points at, again, that fundamental view of human nature. For Hobbes, um, you can't trust each other. You know, you can't trust one another. We're always going to do whatever we do um, out of our own interests. And look, don't blame one another either. It might be necessary just to ensure our own survival, right? I don't, I might be fine now, but how do I know I'm gonna be okay in three weeks? I need to get those bananas just in case, right? So don't blame them, right? But Hobbes would say, everyone's gonna go take those bananas, but not Locke, okay? So um, going back to, to the freedom versus security, you know, Locke's gonna argue, right? That yeah, we still need to move that way towards security, right? We need to get out of the state of nature. Okay, but it's not as uh, vital of a step as it is for Hobbes. Okay, it's still necessary. And we'll see why Locke thinks it's, it behooves us still to get out of the state of nature, even though he's much more optimistic. But for Hobbes, there's nothing worse seemingly than the state of nature. Okay? Um, we're, we're much better off uh, living under any social contract, more on that in a moment here, than we are in, a, in, a, in a, the state of nature. Okay, so Ultimately, all of this, right, we talked about the, st uh, the state of nature and what it looks like and all these sources of conflict here and how these are uh, especially prevalent and problematic in the state of nature. Not pretty. This famously leads Hobbes to conclude that the state of nature is a war, and this is at the top of our, this is the slide or page uh, eight, I should say, war of all against all. Okay. So as he says, quote, every man against every man, he says that on page 183. Now, why is this? Remember, for Hobbes, we're all very self-interested. And for him, you know, that makes sense. Our, our number one goal should always be survival. Okay? That's our right of nature, he says. No matter what happens, we always have the license to do what's ever necessary to survive. Okay? That's our right of nature. And that should always be our pr primary number one focus. So our primary pr uh, goal in life, right, is survival. So says Hobbes. Okay? Now imagine, take that, right? And now imagine a, an environment where to survive, you have to constantly take others out, right? Because they pose potential threats, right? Uh, so that's what the state of nature is, he says, right? Your goal is survival. And in the state of nature, in order to survive, right? Conflict isn't just a possibility. He says you actually ought to almost actively engage in it, right? Because Whenever you see others, right, they could be potential threats. You ought to take them out. Uh, so in the state of nature, a person ought, right? It's not just like it's, you know, probably going to happen, right? If you want to, you know, if you're doing what you ought to do, right, or or what's most optimal for you, if you're, you know, do, taking advantage of your right of nature and trying to survive, then you ought to be trying to take, you know, as much as you can from others, right, and taking them out more or less, because otherwise they're going to pose potential threats to you and could undermine your chances of survival. Okay. So in the state of nature, a person ought to continually try to gain power over others because he, th he says it's it's necessary to even survive in such uh, circumstances. As he puts it on page 183, quote, dominion over men being necessary to a man's conservation, it ought to be allowed him, end quote. Okay. So uh, like it or not, right, conflict, not only is it like a possibility, uh, not only is it permitted, but you ought to be actively engaged in it to take others out, at least preemptively, as much as you can. Um, so very dreary picture, again, this war of all against all that emerges in the state of nature. Is that the case for Locke? No, it's not going to be the case. Okay, but for somebody like Hobbes, who has that 
view of, of human nature, that underlying view of human nature, where we're all, again, focused on our own survival, constantly viewing others as threats, um, constantly only considered and motivated by me, myself, and I. If that's the case, then, okay, it does seem like, you know, that that might be the case then in such a situation, right, when we have a state of anarchy or the state of nature, as he calls it, okay? So in this state of nature, uh, this is page or slide nine, there is no security, no industry. You can't be sure that you can keep whatever you've constructed or created. There's no culture, no navigation, no imported commodities, no building, no large scale works. You can forget anything that would require any extensive time or um, group effort, right? Um, no knowledge for its own sake. You know, this wouldn't be happening, you know, college courses. Uh, in some, no society or civilization, right? It's exactly what we set out to, to explore, right? Well, you know, the, the beginning point when there wasn't the society, civilization, and government. Well, that's exactly what he means by a state of nature, and it's not pretty. So as a result of all this, he famously, very famously, describes life in the state of nature as, quote, nasty, brutish, and short. Very famous description there of Hobbes' state of nature. So turning now to page or slide 10, Remember what he's setting out to do, right, in the Leviathan was discover the, you know, why is it or how is it that we came to be as we are, you know, in groups, in these big societies with, you know, governments and overarching police forcing, policing forces and, and so on. Uh, well, here we have it, right, with the alternative, living in a state of anarchy, running amok in the wilderness without any semblance of structure like we have here, uh, because that's not pretty, right? It's a war of all against all. So um, it's not going to be a surprise then, right, that he says, um, look, it's not a surprise, right, that we come into the, this society, uh, establish a government, and so on, because, again, the alternative, not pretty. So the war of all against all that's characteristic, right, of the state of nature, not in anyone's interest. And that's a big theme here. I mentioned that earlier, right, but this idea of egoism or um, self-interest driving everything, and that's his underlying, indicative of his underlying view of human nature, right? is that we're all extremely self-interested. Right? Everything we do do is motivated by our own interests, okay? including, as we'll see, right, getting out of the state of nature then, and aha, here we have it. You know, why are we in the government within, uh, under the, the arms of a government and in societies and groups? Uh, because we didn't like the alternative, right? And because it suits our interests then, to accept the way we are now, right? Societies being in place, governments being in place, and so on, because it actually furthers our own interests. Okay. So we submit to what he calls a sovereign. So all we mean by that fancy term is just a government, okay? Uh, and this could take any form, right? Whatever, uh, we have this notion of a social contract. I'm throwing a lot of terms up here, sorry about that. All right, so we come together, we're in the state of nature, uh, it's really stinky. None of us like it. Okay, we hate this constant sense of fear and this, uh, ever you know, this constant war of all against all, more or less. And so we come together and we agree. We form a contract. We agree to be governed, if you will, more or less by the sovereign, what he calls the sovereign or the government. Okay, and this will spell out sort of uh, limitations, right, in this process. Then, right of agreeing to a social contract, we're going to place limitations on our behavior. We're going to forfeit our right to everything that we had in that state of nature. Remember how in the state of nature we could do whatever we wanted? That was the problem, according to Hobbes, right? Because not that I could do whatever I wanted, but that you could do whatever you wanted, right? Well, we're going to all come together and form a contract Okay, where we agree, hey, I won't do whatever I want. I won't go and take your bananas. I won't go and take your Guinness. I won't rape, murder, enslave you, etc. Right? Uh, and then you don't, you agree not to do that stuff to me either, right? And in that process, we're forfeiting the right we had in the same nature, our right to everything, our ability to do whatever we wanted. Now, granted, we're not forfeiting all of our rights, all of our freedoms, right? But we're getting, agreeing to not do with certain things, right? So we're forfeiting our our right to everything that we have in the state of nature. And in that process, right, we're establishing a kind of social contract where then a sovereign, we all agree, okay, so we'll, we'll place a sovereign, put a sovereign in place 
who then will enforce the social contract, that government then right, will enforce the social contract or the agreement we've made. Okay. Um, let me make sure I have all, hit all my points here that I wanted to, blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense, right? So we see, uh, again, the, the impetus or the reason why government emerged, right? Because we couldn't take the, op, the, the alternative, right? No government, that's a constant state of war for Hobbes, okay? So the only other option, right, is come together, agree to not do whatever we want, right? Not have a state of anarchy where we have absolute freedom. And in order to, to do that, right, to have that contract and enforce it, you need a sovereign or a government in place. Okay, so hence the impetus for the emergence then of governments. Now, here's our important point, though, right? We're interested in morality or ethics. Well, what about morality? Well, for Hobbes, there, interestingly, there's no sense of morality in the state of nature. There's no sense of right and wrong. I mean, you could try to employ those concepts in the state of nature, but good luck. And in fact, he talks about, I mentioned this in two slides from now or two pages from now, right? But he talks about how, you know, things we associate with immorality nowadays are actually great things back in the state of nature, like force and fraud. Those are great things because they allow us to survive longer, and, you know, especially in the state of nature. So he, he is one who would say, now he's not a moral skeptic, right? He does believe that there is a credible, meaningful sense of morality, right? There is such a thing as right and wrong. But back in the state of nature, there wasn't, right? Uh, what morality comes to mean for someone like Hobbes, right? We only have a meaningful sense of morality once we have instituted a sovereign, right? Once we've enacted or come together and formed a social contract, then and only then do we have some credible means with which to form a sense of morality, right? And basically it comes to mean abiding by the social contract that you've given your consent to, right? So for him, right and wrong, right is basically equivalent to abiding by the contract that you've given your consent to, and wrong is gonna to come to mean, right? Not abiding by it, trying to get away with stuff. Right? So at the same time we had the government emerge, well, that's the first time for Hobbes that we actually had some semblance of morality emerge as well. And don't forget, he's not a moral skeptic. It's just that he didn't think morality existed until we had the social contract in place. So it was something we created, hence it's a convention. Right. It's something we created, moral conventionalism. Okay. It's not something we receive from God or something to that effect, right? That we get somewhere else. We create morality through this social contract, through this agreement we made. It's through our agreement, right, through this social contract, then that we have some sense of morality. It is, again, abiding by the contract or not. Okay. So um, let's turn then to page or slide 11 where I was mentioning, right? Um, so that's just what I was saying. In okay, the state of nature, there's no such thing as right and wrong. In fact, force and fraud were actually, that's this point, actually good things, right, in the state of nature because they ensure your survival longer. Um, so morality only emerges once we've instituted that contract, come together and agree to abide by the contract, which we allow the sovereign to enforce. Okay? Morality only emerges at that point. So we do have a credible sense of morality. He's not a moral skeptic, but Right, that sense of morality is equivalent to basically our laws, right? What's right, what's wrong? What's right, abiding, abiding by the laws, which you've either implicitly or explicitly given your consent to, right? All of us living here, we're kind of in a social contract. We, we more or less, by staying here, taking advantage of the utilities we have, the roads and so on, we've given at least our implied consent, right? That we agree to the contract. And so the sovereign will enforce that. Okay? And it's at that point, right? that we have some sense of morality. What is doing the right thing, according to Hans? Well, it's agreeing to the law, you know, abiding by the laws, right? You're staying here, you take advantage of the roads, then you have a duty, a moral obligation then to abide by all the laws of the government that the government puts in place then, right? Or the contract that's put in place. And so again, right and wrong for Hobbes is equivalent more or less to one's laws, right? The laws of your, your government, right? The, the, the policing force, if you will, that enforces the contract that you've agreed to. Um, now, this shouldn't sit well with you if you're one for whom things like murder, rape, slavery, you, maybe you're one who wants to say, I don't care where you live, what government is or is not in place, these things just are wrong, period. If that's your mindset, and a lot of people, no doubt that's what they think, you know, especially of those extremely heinous sort of sorts of things, if that's your opinion, then this shouldn't sit well with you, right? 
Um, because again, Hobbes is saying, remove ourselves from a social contract, revert back to the state of nature, right? If we're all running amok in the, in the wilderness, well then, hey, rape, murder, slavery, all that stuff, that goes out the window, right? That's not necessarily wrong. It's not right or wrong, right, in the state of nature. Okay? It's only right, or it's only wrong, right, if it's spelled out as being such in the social contract that you've given your consent to, okay? So I just wanted to point that out. Um, now, on the other hand, a lot of people might want to say, hey, there does seem to be, be some element of truth here, right? That when it, what, what our sense of right and wrong boils down to does seem to be more or less abiding by the laws that govern us, okay? or not, if you're doing what's wrong. Okay? And that's, again, that's basically Hobbes' stance. You know, morality, um, there is such a thing as morality, and it's more or less equivalent to abiding by the laws of of your land, of the land, or the youth government, right, that oversees you and enforces that social contract. Uh, blah, 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 let's turn to, so I mentioned, you know, the idea that it's a convention, this is page or slide 12, so morality is a convention, something indicative of our free choice in social institutions, again, it's not something handed down to us by God, or that exists outside of us, right, or that exists independently of us, right, it's dependent on us, okay, it's our convention, it's our creation, it's something we create, okay, and it's a reflection, again, of Right? We have something to gain out of morality. It's a kind of a life preserver, if you will. Okay. Um, again, right and wrong amounts to abiding by the contract, social contract, which we created to help get us out of the state of nature. Right, So it was all in an effort to further our own, our own interests. This is turning to page or slide 13 where we're talking about egoism. Okay, So again, egoism is this idea that things are done out of self-interest. And we'll talk more about egoism later on in the course as well. Um, and so that's exactly what Hobbes is saying. Everything that happens is driven by egoism, uh, by our own selfish desires and wants. And it might seem weird, right? We forfeit our right to everything. Um, we for how is that in our own interest? Right? How does it make sense to suggest that giving up freedom um, is in our interest? Well, it is in the sense that otherwise, right, you're constantly fearing your own survival, right? Because everybody else has freedom too, absolute freedom. Um, so it is in your own interest in the sense that you finally gain some semblance of security by forfeiting your freedom along with everyone else, forfeiting some of their freedoms, right? You finally garner some degree of security, right? and that's the sense in which it actually, in fact, is in our interest. Okay? So again, everything we do is in our own interest, including the creation, the convention of morality itself. Okay? Every individual has something to gain by submitting to the sovereign. Okay, as the laws of nature, and we'll get more into the laws of nature in the second part of this lecture, and I meant to allude to that, and we'll have two parts here. Um, we'll get into the specific laws of nature, the steps, kind of the rational steps that he delineates that we sort of realize that we need to sort of take to get out of the, the, uh, the state of nature, right? Um, he says we have, right, obviously we're gaining something, right? We're gaining something by following those specific laws of nature, and our sense of morality is ultimately, again, reduced okay, to a life preserver, right? It's, it's following these steps that are necessary to get out of that uh, horrible situation that was the state of nature. Okay? So, again, our sense of morality is ultimately reduced to a reflection of certain laws of nature, which we'll get into in, in more detail in the second part of this lecture, which, again, tells us how to best preserve ourselves. We have to take these certain steps. Otherwise... The only other option is that crappy state of nature, which none of us want. Okay, so we have to take these steps. We realize in order to get out of that state state of nature, and one of those steps is, in some sense, the creation of morality via the social contract. Right, we finally get that sense of right and wrong through the creation and institution of that contract. And at that point, according to Hobbes, we finally have some meaningful or credible sense of right and wrong for the first time. Right, right comes to mean abiding by that contract and wrong comes to mean not abiding by the contract okay so a lot there and i mentioned i don't know if this was at the end of the last video mentioned how tricky and difficult the reading can actually be the hobbes reading um, even though i think what he's really getting at underneath it all is pretty straightforward uh the reading is pretty intense in terms of the the long sentences and so on so i do realize that but again hopefully it's starting to kind of make sense what he's getting at. Pretty straightforward, I would say, underneath it. Um, it is interesting, especially, I think, the differences between um, Hobbes and Locke. And we've already really focused on one of them right, quite a bit, right? The 
fund fundamental difference in their views of human nature, right? Hobbes being much more an optimist and Locke being much more, or sorry, Hobbes being much more of a pessimist and uh, Locke being much more of an optimist. Uh, but we'll pick up on then a couple other differences, significant differences as well as we move forward. So I'll leave you this first part of the, the lecture, leave you with that. Uh, you have some intermission questions to kind of pick up on where we're at at this point. If you want to do, you know, your post in the forums on an intermission question, feel free. Uh, basically, I like the uh, second question quite a bit. You know, would you want to take an all expenses paid vacation to the state of nature? Always get some interesting um, responses there. You know, are you just taking a little vacation or you maybe maybe you want to move there, right? The state of nature doesn't sound too bad. You know, maybe you're not the pessimist Hobbes is and, you know, you're a little bit more trusting. But anyway, uh, feel free to answer one of those questions. When we reconvene for the second part of, you know, this lecture, we'll get into more, again, those specific uh, laws of nature, that he's, the steps that he spells out that are these rational steps to get out of the state of nature. And we'll talk about some more nuanced points uh, in his theory, right? The, especially the, the need for a, a very powerful sovereign to be in place in order to enforce, adequately enforce the social contract. And again, this hinges on his underlying dreary view of human nature. You can't trust people. So he's going to, to focus on that and suggest having a contract, that's great. But nobody's going to abide by it unless you have some sort of threat in place, right? Unless they fear the consequences of not doing so. Because people, you can't trust them otherwise. So we need an all-powerful sovereign to lay down the hammer, right? In instances where people try to be sneaky and get away with stuff and not abide by the contract. So we'll, we'll uh, you know, emphasize that point and a few other uh, nuanced points in his theory. And then we'll summarize it. Uh, and then we'll move on the next lecture, lecture four, to Locke then and talk more about him. So... Anyway, until the second part of this lecture, I uh, hope you enjoyed this first part. Thanks.